BWRW stands for Be Wild Rewild. Just, and this, is, this is the only time you'll see the abbreviation. Here are some basic ideas. The land and the life in it can heal itself with and without human help, and especially without it. Now, that has a couple of facets to it. One of, the, one of those facets is we've really made a mess of things, right? We as a species have made a mess of the planet. Well, if we keep trying, is it going to get better or worse? The other element is that nature knows what it's doing. It may not have a central nervous system like us, although some parts of nature do. But it knows what it's doing. Luke over here and I have worked on a couple of stream projects in the past few months. A naturally flowing stream is a self-organizing system without any human help. We fix problems when we do stream projects. We fix problems with streams to restore them back closer to, and hopefully very close to, what they should be like as a naturally functioning system. So nature works with and without us. It's time for us to work with nature rather than expect nature to, to subject itself to our will. Adapting to climate change, that's sort of the big one in the room, right? It's the elephant that people are talking about more and more. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the game changer coming up. Uh, there are lots of other reasons to think about rewilding uh, in, in uh, dis discussion format or in conceptual terms, and then produce some action out of it. And the action is going to be somewhat minimal because we're talking about letting nature do what it wants to. So next click, if you will. All right. I'm wearing two wires. There are two cameras on me. There's a third wire down here. He's recording me. Uh, am I a celebrity now? You're, a celebrity. You're actually live on Facebook. And as is everyone. Hello. Oh, potentially the entire world is watching. Right, right, exactly. All right, so within Be Wild, Rewild, there is the idea of big river connectivity as a concept. What does it mean? It means reconnecting the landscape across small and large scales. And that involves things called cores and corridors and crossings, which is not a word up there, but it's an important one, and predators. Predators. And suddenly your imaginations are running wild here, in a sense. Uh, you're thinking, wait a minute, is he talking about bears and wolves and mountain lions? and uh, the huge things that are sort of threatening to human beings? Nah. Yeah, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> At least think about their presence on the land, even if it never comes to fruition, because, because what do they add that's missing on the landscape? What do they add that's missing? Deer control. <laughs> well. Yes. Adventure. Adventure. <laughs> Ecological health. Diversity. Okay. Even if we don't allow the bears and the big cats and the big dogs back on the landscape because people are too afraid of them and we have pets and, and all that, even if we don't allow them, how can we replace their function at least? Right. What is missing? So what lands are best suited for rewilding in our view? Um, the best lands are not the most fertile farm ground or the best pastures in the world, okay? So we're not targeting agriculture at its heart. We're, we're working around the fringes of agriculture in the Midwest to say there are lands that are currently unproductive. They have high slopes. Who would ever put cropland on high slopes in Iowa? You know, a 14% slope that goes about like this uh, maybe in Western Iowa, they have combines with those crooked heads on them that could work a 14% slope. But is that the best land to be in crops? And the, the answer to that is no, 
because it's also very erodible land. It's not going to be the most productive for very long. What about flooding land? Luke and I just did a calculation together for a client, and uh, we looked at some flood data versus flood risk models for uh, central Iowa, for the Des Moines area. What is supposed to be a 1% chance per year flood has happened four times in 20 years, making it what? What is the percentage we came up with there? 20%? 20% actual occurrence, not risk level, actual occurrence. 20 times higher than the risk level. If that's a trend, that means that a lot of floodplain is going to be useless for agriculture. Absolutely useless. It'll be too wet during the planting season and harvest season and much of the rest of the year, perhaps. That's land that becomes unproductive. What happens to it? Um, this map here is just sort of a pretty map, although it encodes a section of the Iowa River between uh, a little town called Le Grand, no, Montour is the little left box, uh, left side box, and then over here you have Toledo, Iowa, and Tama, Iowa, and somewhere in here, is the Meskwaki uh, Settlement. I almost called it a reservation. That's a, no, no. The Meskwaki Settlement. And uh, the yellow and black show varying slopes. So you, you can see that the yellow and almost white areas are very high slopes on that particular map. That's the kind of land we're talking about here. The blue maps out the five-year floodplain, or the 20% risk level, not actual occurrence, but there's a 20% chance every year, or one year in five, that that will flood out. That's not especially suitable land for crops. Now, a farmer might make a profit off of it if that risk level holds true, but if it's happening three times in five years, that's not productive, profitable ground. Where do we start? I, in a moment, I'll define what a core and a corridor are, but where do we start? We can start with existing public lands. This is a panoramic shot, in other, in other words, several photos assembled together up at Broken Kettle Grasslands in Northwest Iowa. That's Lus Hills. Oh, yeah. That's the Lus Hills landscape. That's, the far northern end. We can find some tracts of land that approach 10,000 acres in size, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. Some examples of existing public lands, Chichaco Greenbelt, the Iowa River Corridor, uh, Shimek and Stevens State Forest, Union Slough, and if you take all of the Loves Hills and lump it together, you come up with that 10,000 figure or more. <clears throat> There are also large private tracts of land like White Rock Conservancy in Guthrie County, west central Iowa. It's around 5,000 acres in size. And it includes a beautiful river valley on the Middle Raccoon River. It includes productive agricultural land where they're doing experiments with things like cover cropping and other farm practices, uh, grazing on um, partial uh, native, native plant pastures, uh, a variety of other things, and they also have recreation there. So it's like you get everything in one 5,000 5, acre parcel. Small promo for White Rock, it's one of my favorite places in Iowa. Um, and then you also have Broken Kettle Grasslands, which is privately owned by the Nature Conservancy, and it's a few thousand acres in size. So we've got the basis for some good sized biodiversity areas in Iowa or what we can also call cores and corridors. Rewilding, what and why? We don't necessarily promote fire on the landscape, but that is a prairie bunch grass, one of the tall grass species. I couldn't tell when I took the picture of which one, but it's growing in the spring after the burn. It's coming back. So it's a symbol of what rewilding means. A lot of things will come back. Much will come back. 
We may not be able to imagine how exactly, and it may take several human lifetimes. So it takes patience, patience that a single individ individual cannot muster, it, and it runs against the grain, right? Because we want to see results now. We're so oriented to, well, within my lifetime, I'd like to see all 9 million, million acres in Iowa be rewilded, right? It's not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, it's just not going to happen, even for the young people who, who are scattered through the audience. You may not see that, but it's a process that could happen. What is rewilding? Three definitions, one from the great authority Wikipedia. <laughs> Large-scale conservation aimed at restoring and protecting natural processes and core wilderness areas, providing connectivity important point, connectivity between such areas and protecting or reintroducing apex predators and keystone species. Now, if you don't like the apex predators in that one, you can come down to the third one from Rewild in Europe, a progressive approach to conservation, letting nature take care of itself. Letting nature take care of itself. We phrase that as trusting wildness. Stepping back, relinquishing human control. And there may still be a place for the things that Luke and I do, which are active restoration management, but they would be strategically placed. And in the meantime, since we cannot control that 9 million acres, we don't have the human capacity to restore that much land, we have to trust let evolution play out, let Darwinian natural selection and genetics and gene flow and all that stuff that you learned you maybe didn't like when you learned it, you have to let it take place. Wildness is a quality and wilderness a place, and they are not the same thing. And that's from Henry David Thoreau. Wildness is more about what's in the heart and the head Whereas wilderness is a place, and it's a, a, an imaginary place. And even though we have places we call wildernesses, and we try to make them fit a certain view of the world, they fit our imaginations, or we try to make them fit our imaginations, and therefore we're still controlling the game, or trying to control it. So wilderness, goes against the idea of wildness, in most cases. Uh, I want to save the questions until the end, if you don't mind. Two examples on the screen here. Um, so I was standing on the beach one time at uh, Grace Lake in Des Moines, which is an old uh, gravel quarry pit that now is a recreational area. And it began to rain quite hard for a few minutes. And I stood and watched on that sand beach at a little tiny river about an inch and a half across self-organized itself. And if you look at that and you know streams, every basic feature of a large river is in that tiny rivulet of water flowing down the sand. It's got a point bar, it's got a cut bank, it's got a riffle, it has what we call a tall wig, uh, which is a feature of the channel. It, it's all there, and it happened like that. Here's a fence post, and you've probably seen fence posts like this that have this orange stuff on them. Uh, let's see, I bet Diane Porter knows what that is. <laughs> Fire dot. Fire dot lichen. And that, uh, on wood that's exposed like that, uh, sometimes old corn cribs are entirely covered on one side with that, that lichen. It just shows up. It's almost magical. It's just there and it's growing and abundant. It's beautiful. Next. Why rewilding? We don't have the ability as human, be human beings to agree on what to do. <laughs> Long story short, <laughs> try <coughs> taking these ideas to the state house in Des Moines. You know, you will be laughing. I predict. 
<coughs> so the scale of the need here, in order to have a functioning landscape on which humans could, could survive for the long tar term, or not. So our presence may or may not be important here. We may be going extinct as a species. We don't know yet, but you know, it's a dangerous time. The scale of the need exceeds our capacity for human labor. We can't make everybody work on restoration practices across the landscape. Financing political foresight, and self-interest. Just good old self-interest, you know? I still want to make a really large profit off of my 30,000 acres that I pay my land managers to, to take care of poorly, as long as I get my 210 acres of corn off of it. You know, that's, that's the self-interest part. Of it. It's the profit statement. It's the extractive economic thinking that we have. So here's another quote that I really like. And, and Ross has thrown a lot of quotes my way, and I, I kind of pick and choose the ones I like the best. <laughs> I'll never get another grant. <laughs> Nature is not only more complex than you think, it is more complex than you can think. Than you can think. So, but we could figure it all out, all out with science, with the scientific approach, right? Oh, well, yeah. I just collected a few specimens of moss out at Round Prairie because I, I would like to take them home and figure out what they are. That's a scientific process of identification. What did I do to those samples? I killed them, didn't I? Yes. All right. Science, in some ways, is a destructive process. And we don't know what we're destroying. Well, I know that I'm destroying a little bit of moss, and I was careful to select only a small bit of each clump that I ran across and wanted to collect. But I don't know the long-term impact on the clump itself, and I won't go back to find out. Did I, uh, did I cause some, some kind of communal disturbance that will kill off the entire clump? I know that I killed my specimens. They won't survive this. I've looked at mosses enough to know that they're little tiny organisms that sometimes show up in there. And they're dependent on the mosses. Some of them are called springtails, and there are others as well. Did I collect and kill some springtails? Science is an inherently destructive process in seeking knowledge about the world around us. There are ways to be non-destructive about it, but sometimes we violate Aldo Leopold's advice to us about keeping the parts. The, the intelligent tinkerer keeps all the parts. Well, we don't even know what we're destroying, so we can't follow out of the hole. We don't know what we're tearing out. So, cores. What is a core? At least 10,000 acres of adjacent land, preferably semicircular in shape, so that it has a central area that's a biodiversity area protected by an outer buffer. Although in, in Iowa, I'll tell you, from, from doing mapping, we're going to have a lot of long, narrow cores and corridors because of the river systems here. So that we just live with that landscape and do the best we can. Um, large predators that may require 40,000 acres or more. What I've read about the Western literature is the female mountain lion, uh-oh, we're back to big cats again. A uh, female mountain lion out west requires 40,000 acres. It could be different here, but who knows? We don't have the cats around to find out. We have lynxes. Hmm? We have lynxes. We have lynxes, but they're a smaller animal with a different dietary requirement. So not the exact model for a bigger cat. Why cores? Lots of reasons why to have cores. Biodiversity. 
Maintain that biodiversity as though our lives depend on it. Wait, as though? <laughs> Listed species and declining species protections. These are some of the secondary reasons. Endangered ecosystem preservation and conservation. Breeding and wintering territories for all, site, all sorts of critters. And just the overall ecosystem diversity as well as species diversity in the core. This is an example I pulled off the web, and I'm going to step away from the mic and shout at you for a moment. So here we have in the center a core area surrounded by a buffer zone, and the buffer zone uh, protects the inner core area but it may also be a multi-purpose area. So this inner conservation core would be at least 10,000 acres in size. The buffer area could include some things like, for example, intensive paddock grazing, hmm. or some cropland on very low slopes that it incorporates perennial root systems in the ground. Hmm. This is a relatively new idea about having living roots in the ground all year long in crop ground. The research has been done on it, at least initial research, and it's a possibility without creating competition between the corn or soybeans for nutrients and water and the cover crops that are growing in the, in the shade, literally, literally under those crop plants. And then we have corridors. So let's go to the next slide, which I believe is another uh, core. Yes, this is uh, one of the maps that was drawn up for this project in particular. So what you are seeing here is some fine print. And again, I step away from the mic. Right here is the Des Moines River Basin. Right here is the Sheraton River Basin. There's a watershed divide along here between the two basins. And right in this area, it's literally crossing a fence to get from one basin to the other. In a place like that, that's an ideal location to have wildlife crossings because there's, there's very little distance to travel from one basin to the next. And so when you're talking about wildlife in motion, that's a great place for it to happen. Now, does it happen? Well, this is mostly crop ground in here with some pasture. This is southern Iowa, so it's pretty rough land, very hilly land. But we find that there are established public lands, the units of Stevens State Forest. <clears throat> And if we draw cores of at least 10,000 acres around each of those units of Stevens State Forest, we end up with at least 10,000 acres in each one. So when I drew this map, I looked for wooded <coughs> land, high slope land, and floodplain land to include in the larger core. On the thinking that those are the least productive for agriculture. This core, I labeled it the Stevens West Core, is 18,599 acres. Now, that's not a fixed thing, because if we do a presentation like this in that location with people, we're going to make it very obvious to them that, you know, this is a hypothetical. It's up to you on the ground, knowing the people, the landowners, knowing the landscape far better than any of us do, to figure out what the actual core boundaries might look like in your discussions, and then at some point to begin to put it into place. Here's a corridor connection between the Des Moines River, the upper Sheraton, heading downstream through Lake Rathbun, which is a very large core, 39,000 acres, excluding 21,000 for the lake surface itself when it's at average pool level. But then we continue downstream. Next slide, please. So what's a corridor? A corridor is a narrow connection between cores. It uses that low productivity land 
And actually, low productivity is a misleading statement that I, I should have taken out of this already, and I'll hear about it later. <laughs> it's actually a high productivity area if you think about the landscape and biodiversity. This is high productivity area. And it's to our benefit to let it be wild, to our benefit, to let the ecosystems function the way they should. Minimum 1,000 foot width, but wider is better. Purposes include climate resilience, so that things can move north if they have to, or move south if they have to. Dispersal of animal young, a basic function that happens on the landscape already. Migration. There were three robins outside the door here. They may have been here all winter, I don't know. But there were red wing blackbirds, blackbirds tonight out here in the trees. So those are the early arrivals and kind of testing it out, saying, is spring here or not? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but they're pretty tough birds. And once in a while at Iowa feeders, you'll find red-winged blackbirds in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Not commonly, but once in a while. Population reestablishment, something that used to be there, comes back on its own. We're talking about plants as well as animals. Plants as well as animals. Okay. By the way, uh, just as an example of that, when I drove up late this afternoon, got out of the car, I saw that on my jacket were some prairie seeds. I had walked through some mm -hmm. prairie at Round Prairie, southeast of town, and I had collected what looked like some Indian grass and a tick trefoil and maybe mm -hmm. one or two other species. And I sat out there very intentionally and picked those seeds off of my coat and just let them fly away on the wind. Okay? I am a mammal. I am a fur-bearing creature. And even though I substitute clothing for fur, I still carry seeds with me. I still function like a mammal. So, Seed and spore dispersal, and I throw spores in there, again, as uh, Diane knows very well, looking at things like mosses and lichens, spores are a thing. And when it comes to, say, underground communication networks between trees hmm. by way of fungal connections, spores suddenly become hugely important. Linking ecosystems on a small scale, ecoregions on a larger scale, and entire biomes, which is you know like a third of the planet at its size, or something like that. It's almost so large that it's a useless concept. Here's one other example of a map that shows core areas in green following waterways, so they're long and skinny, and corridors between cores in blue, and that's the state of Minnesota. Uh, this professor at Winona State University, Neil Mundell, has mapped these out already, and I just found that on the internet. All right, so this is the map that shows that last map right here. This is the Upper Sheraton, and we were looking at a corridor and a core, and uh, actually I think I have the colors reversed on this map because it's an older version of the map, so, you know, I confused my audience. So. Uh, so the blue here is, uh, is the core area, and the orange is the corridor, and that's the only time to see that mistake, I, I hope. Um, so this is the Sheraton River. It spills into Missouri. Why is this important? Okay, we're about connecting regions together. This is the Ozarks Plateau. It's an entirely different eco zone than anything to the north of it. We're still in the southern drift plains here, an ancient glacial surface. <coughs> Down here, we're in a different landscape with different plants and animals. Well, if climate change involves the warming of the, the ecosystems around us. Do you think some of those plants and animals will want to come north? And how will they do it if there are rewilded cores and corridors to make it happen? This is the Des Moines River, 
And then there's a skip up to the Skunk River and Cedar Creek. Have you, know, you heard of Cedar Creek? I <laughs> have. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then there are alternate ways across the landscape to get into the Des Moines Basin. There's even a way to get up to Des Moines, right here, skirt it, go up to another part of the Des Moines River, the Skunk Basin, and the Iowa River, which is my watershed. There's the Iowa River, mapped clear to the Mississippi. And with the little dodge around Iowa City, because it's a major hurdle, I went up to Cedar, the Cedar River, down in the waves, but I tell you, by doing that, I included a lot of beautiful wetland area in the lower cedar and a lot of beautiful woodland that wouldn't have been included in this map otherwise. Carnivores, really? Yes. <laughs> nice answer. <laughs> yes. Well, we already have them, folks. <clears throat> that little long legged fly on the left, it's about a quarter of an inch long. You've probably never seen one before. Hmm. They're everywhere. Well, they're not robber flies, they're a different group, yeah. Um, but like robber flies, they are predatory and they hang out around flowers, especially around native plants hmm. when they're in, in flower. Why? Because they like to zoom in like a fighter jet. See the shape of it? It kind of looks like an old delta wing fighter, right? from back in the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. They zoom in, grab a bee off a flower, and off they go. Mm -hmm. Bees? But we like bees. Well, so do long-legged flies. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a crab spider. Uh, you probably can't see it because it blends in with the flower. It's yellow. Mm -hmm. But it's there. They hang out like this on the flower, and they wait for somebody to come along, a bee or a fly or whatever, and then suddenly, <laughs> like a crab, and they snag their prey. Mm -hmm. Next is a red-tailed hawk with a snake. And uh, this may be the only time tonight that I actually swear the snake's mouth is open. Holy shit! <laughs> 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 yes, I think other animals have intelligence, and that's one of the reasons why. Mm. You know, that snake is, ah! <laughs> looking, looking straight over her head at a yellow-throated warbler, not a common warbler in Iowa, and that was in Des Moines along one of the tributaries of the Raccoon River, and uh, it posed there very nicely for me. Uh, it happens to be a male. Here's another, oh, by the way, warbler, size for size, ounce for ounce, are one of the most vicious predators we have. In the world. <laughs> they have to eat constantly. Constantly. <laughs> Snapping turtle. Hmm. We even have predatory plants in Iowa. This is a common bladder bird that I photographed out of Dunbar Slough in Green County. <clears throat> And if you go to the fens and bogs in the northeast part, you'll find other predatory plants too, like Venus flytraps mm. and pitcher plants in the, in the sphagnum bogs. Predatory plants? Wow, that's cool. So the photograph in the background is of a student at Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge outside Des Moines. And uh, what's he doing? Well, he's been in cutting black locust seedlings and saplings as part of a restoration effort there. Why black locust? Because it doesn't belong in Iowa and because it spreads rapidly and takes over prairies. Hmm. And I put that in not because that practice fits within our vision, but because that practice is an example of giving back to the land. We need to adjust our thinking and this may be an audience that already knows this, we need to take and give back. Every time a farmer harvests a crop off his land, he's committing soil erosion because the material in that crop doesn't go back to the land. Right? It goes off the land somewhere. That's soil erosion. In the old days, and I've done this, you know, 
the farmers used to take the manure out, put it on the land, and now they spray it out from a big blue tank, right, near uh, an animal confinement. So some of that still happens, right? Um, but we aren't giving back the right things in enough quantity at this point to make it a sustainable practice. Giving back. And rather than go through the rest of this slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a, a Jewish philosopher. He would say, yes, I, I was Jewish, but I'm not a philosopher. Uh, he rejected that title. His name was Martin Buber. Uh -huh. He wrote a book called Ich und Du in German, or I and Thou in English. What is involved in giving back? We look at the world around us, and, and instead of saying it, I want it, I want it, I'm taking it, we say, you, I have a relationship with you, whether it be a lichen on the bark of a tree, or it be the microorganisms in the soil, or it be the birds overhead, whatever you can imagine, you which gives that other entity legitimacy and credibility as part of the real world alongside us. Alongside us. And that's the basis for a lot of spiritual beliefs and uh, cultural practices that are disappearing rapidly. That realization that the world around us is a you, not an it. This is something that, by the way, uh, Ross over here didn't approve, so it's new for him. <laughs> Hopefully I still have that money, you know. <laughs> he laughed, so I think that's good news. But we've got to overcome the, ext the extractive economy. The world around us isn't it. We can do with it as we please. We were given dominion over it. You know, that's a culturally based thought system. Communities. So we've got cores, corridors, and communities, and we'll do crossings in a little bit. I've already talked about carnivores, those predators. Communities, of course there are plant and animal communities, and for the moment I want to focus on human communities. We have face-to-face -face and virtual communities now, and I don't have my cell phone on me, so I feel slightly helpless, of course. Um, but. Uh, you know, here we're face to face. And over the past two days, I've established and enhanced several great relationships with people here in Fairfield. And I'm thankful for that. That's how I think the whole rewilding vision gets going, is because we get in your face, so to speak. You know, we're, we're trying to take the kind approach here, I guess, but. Uh, you know, it's about relationships, it's about teaching, it's about what? It's about exchanging perspectives on a non-threatening, non-conflictual basis so that when you confront that farmer who says, hell no, you say, well, think about it for a couple of weeks and then I'll get in touch with you again, see what you think. And in the meantime, oh, go to this NRCS presentation see what they have to say about the things I'm talking about. You know, uh, you, know you, you do things like that, and eventually the message starts to get through to some people. So we have to not only community, communicate, uh, I almost made it up a new word right there, uh, communicate <laughs> the goals of Big River connectivity and be wild, rewild, and rewilding as a general concept, but we have to engage the people who are easily engaged and be patient with the people who are less easily engaged until it sinks in that there's something to this. We have to talk about what the goals and opportunities are. We've had some great discussions about opportunities, land that might be for sale, um, using a small restoration project to start a rewilding pro process on a stream in, in this town. All sorts of cool stuff. I, I told you at the beginning, I'm almost exhausted from this experience because the conversations have been so intense. 
and wonderful. <laughs> and then we build the larger societal conversation and the shift, the massive shift in perspective that's required here, not only because our lives depend on it and our species depends on it, because, but because every other species, those yous, those mul multiple yous out there also depend on it and they have value. They have worth independently of the worth we assign to. Right here, this is the state of Iowa so far. And this is actually uh, actually a DNR map. The 20, 2016 uh, impaired water waterways map. Okay, these are all the streams in Iowa that are impaired by either nitrogen pollution from farm fields and urban lawns or phosphorus pollution from the same sources, or bacterial, or two or more of those three things. What's yellow? It's yellow, uh, yes, not as impaired? Uh, part of the impairment depends also on how the stream is being used by human beings. So, you know, if you're a muscle in the stream, they didn't score that, but they scored human use. So the yellow areas are less intensely used and therefore, by definition, less impaired. Here are some of the problems that we face. So we confront flooding and loss of natural hydrology on the landscape, loss of soil depth and health, impaired waters, as you just saw, the Gulf hypoxic zone. Those shrimp fishermen are very patient with, with us, let me tell you. Uh, it's a wonder they haven't sued the D Department of Agriculture and every green farmer in the state. And every, and every city. And every city, too. Yeah, uh, so, you know, we can't leave out the city areas because they're big contributors. Uh, Des Moines Water Works takes a lot of nitrogen out of the drinking water. What do they do with it? Dump it back in. They put yeah. it back in. No. <laughs> uh, Downstream somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> And the big problem here really is domination of the planet by one species. We are, for the time being, the apex predator or the apex omnivore on the planet that's highly problematic. Uh, this is on a client's land in Scott County. At date of point 42, I estimated over 16 inches of soil loss on a high slope cropped strip of land. Now, there's a landowner, she's female, 60% of absentee landowners in Iowa are women. The tenant farmer swears there's no soil erosion there. Well, that's odd. Uh, why? Are you getting soil collars up in this range on the surface instead of down here? No carbon. There's no carbon. Should there be carbon? Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, that's an actual picture. The yellow is, the, is a, our view of color. Right, right, right along this slope here, where you, you see the row crop. It was a cornfield the year I visited it. Okay? That's 9% plus slope. That's the kind of stuff that we want to put into a rewilded area. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that 16 inches over what period of time? That's a little hard to say, um, but when I was there, and I documented with photography the fact that the uh, rains, well, let's see, I visited on July 30th, 2018. So in the four weeks before that, there had been rainfall events that were half an inch or maybe a little larger. I documented with photography channels that were one to two inches deep and one to three inches across. So that soil was in motion actively, but not a stable slope. Rewilding is an answer. So going beyond what Luke and I typically do, which is active restoration, which still fits in the picture somewhere, okay? But beyond that, remember we don't have the capacity and we pretend to ourselves that we have the control. It's only a pretense. It's only a figment of our imagination. A quote, again from Thoreau, a town is saved not more by the righteous men in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it. A township where one primitive forest waves above while another rots below, 
That's a good thing, by the way. Such a town is fitted to raise not only corn and potatoes, but poets and philosophers for the coming ages. Brilliant statement. And I put that over a map of what? Cedar Creek, Fairfield. That's your town that Thoreau was talking about all those years ago. Here's some of the mapping, and again, I'll go through this quickly, but there are some goals associated with this mapping effort and with Be Wild, Rewild in general. So I'll talk about the goals as we go. This map was produced by Nis and Gadia, who's my associate uh, uh, partner in crime in, in, in map making. So he puts these online. I'm not able to do that with my maps yet, so I can't show them to the world except as image photos. Uh, but it's much more cool to have an interactive map so you can slide that slider back and forth. You can turn layers on and off to see cropped land and high slope land or take that off the map and so forth. And uh, he has this, that process down and I don't. Goal one, create user-friendly geospatial maps with visual and informational impact. This is the high tech part. Goal two, identify potential cores and corridors. So we started with the Iowa River because I lived there. And then I was gently guided along to understand that it was bigger than just one river drainage in Iowa. Next was the Sheraton. Next was taking the Sheraton and the Iowa and connecting them together. And then it was the Lus Hills. And then it was going west to connect to the Great Plains. And then it was the Driftless area in Northeast Iowa. And now I've done some other work too that we'll see in a moment. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, using geospatial mapping software, it's possible to put in a lot of detail about a specific location. This is important for you to realize here. What is the information? This is in Lee County, not far away from you. It's on the Des Moines River. So this is actually the Iowa-Missouri border right there. And the green circles, areas of the Shimek State Forest, which is existing public land. Here, I got it right. So the cores are in orange and the corridors are in blue. You can put in information like the Lee County Corridor, as I called it and drew it. It's 22,592 acres in size more or less, it can be more, it can be a lot less, and still function as a corridor. So this isn't a land grab, that's not what it's about. Climate resiliency is important for this core, as is bird migration, and as it is true for your area here, and for much of Southeast Iowa, amphibian and reptile conservation is an important goal here. I just read that a species of frog I had never heard of, and I thought I knew all the species, or had read about them at least, a species of Iowa frog that apparently exists only in Iowa has just gone extinct. Oh, no. I would rather see the word extirp extirpated because that means it exists out of the state somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. The word was extinct. <clears throat> a couple of the species that exist in this area of the state, Lee County, the yellow mud turtle. Who's heard of a yellow mud turtle? <laughs> the eastern musk turtle, who's heard of that one? Okay, what's in your, uh, not wallet, but area? So here's a bigger map. It just shows the entire connection that from the Missouri and the Ozark Plateau really up to the Des Moines Lobe, the glacial surface at the very north end, and east to the Mississippi River. All this can be connected. It can be connected. It can be ecologically functional. It can be wild again. Lus Hills region, here in order to avoid St. Joe and Kansas City, I had to go overland with the mapping. But there's one nice big fat core right there, the big orange one in northern Missouri, it's 60,000 acres of wooded land, probably mostly in private ownership, but it's a potentially huge core. Next. Oh, oh, uh, goal three. 
inspire ideas and explore possibilities. And that's already been ha happening here, okay? And you're on the road already. You've, you've got people who are excited about this and want to do something, want to talk more about it. Uh, so the questions here, what is possible near me? Some of those answers are emerging right now. What can I do? Some of those answers are in place. Who else? Again, it's already in motion here in the Fairfield area, Jefferson County. Next. Goal four, move from the Iowa to the, or from the state of Iowa, I should say, to the rest of the basin. Kansas City area, westward across the Osage River. No, I'm sorry, this is St. Louis. So this is the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the Osage River get, gets us connected to the Great Plains. This is a tributary of the Arkansas River. The, I think it's the Neosho River right here. We're connected to the Arkansas, which goes southeast into the Mississippi. Again, we've got numerous connections to the Mississippi, but we're also connected to the Great Plains. And there's the big map, mm -hmm. the entire Missouri Mississippi <laughs> Basin. Look at some of the public land holdings in here. This is, I think, the Lincoln National Forest. I don't know how many acres are in there, but it's going to be over a million acres. Go out west, these are national forest lands. I believe this one is around four million acres. You think they have mountain lions in there? <laughs> you head up the Wisconsin River, and somewhere up in here, you are going to encounter black bears. Will they come south? Well, we might. So this one um, is called Reconnecting a Continent because this entire basin sits where? Between two coasts. With this vision in mind, we've now connected, reconnected an entire continent. It blows my mind. Um, we've let this horse out of the gate now, and I'm being dragged along. <laughs> It's a bumpy ride, let me tell you. Think and act locally, wildlife crossings, and then we'll end with some resources. Let's go through this kind of quickly. Um, I shot this from my car in Marion County, Iowa in 2016. This twin pair, twinned pair of fawns in the ditch. Why wildlife crossings? Safe passage across human landscapes that include things like roads and railroads. Accident prevention and reduction, beautification, creating more beautiful landscape with crossing designs. Where do we put them? At known wildlife crossings, especially deer crossings, because, because uh, you know, how many of you have hit a deer? How many of you have been injured in a deer car accident? Okay. And the last question is, how many of you have died in a deer? <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody puts their hand up, I have questions for you. <laughs> Just a few crossings I pulled off the internet. Wildlife overpass. This one is in Banff National Park, Alberta, Canada. This is a turtle crossing under a railroad. That's in Japan. We have one turtle crossing in the state. I haven't seen it, but it exists somewhere out there, and I'd like to see it sometime. This one is a wildlife overpass. No, that's the road up there. This is an underpass. Why they had to light it, I don't know. <laughs> this, this one is uh, in Finland. In Finland, okay. I said something about the Europeans, right? That they kind of get this more than we do here. This one is on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana. This is their, la their native language saying, Animals Bridge. <laughs> Some of the Flathead undoubtedly know how to say you to the wild world around them and not it. And I say some of them because so many, uh, so many native groups are factionalized now and they fight amongst themselves a lot over resources, money, and, you know, all the usual stuff. They've been well colonized. 
local actions. We already have some. Dick DeAngelis' short film, Cedar Creek. Uh, it's a very significant film, not just because I'm in it, but yeah. uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful film. It's a beautiful yeah. film. Beautiful. And he's a wonderful producer to put something like that together. And you know that already before this came out, because he did so much about Fairfield's history and, and uh, Native people in this area. That may be a forthcoming film, I don't remember. There's going to be eight of them already. Eight, eight all together. Yeah. And he's got four done, so he's uh, halfway three through. Three done, and fourth yeah. working. On fourth now, okay. Okay. Well, Dick really gets this. Uh, you have so much information to work with on the local level. You've got the local history and knowledge of the landscape. Some of that is right here in this room. Okay. It's humbling to think how much of it is here in this room already. Think about how much more is outside these walls somewhere in your area. The Iowa Wildlife Action Plan, which I used for some of the map making here, that's a resource available to you. Surrounding states, wildlife areas, if you want to broaden your vision and think about, well, what are we connecting to? Missouri has a wildlife action plan. All states do. It's a federally required thing. Um, there are the Iowa water trails. Could Cedar Creek be a water trail? Parts of the skunk already are. The Iowa impaired waters tells you about the pollution in the streams near you. The Nature Conservancy had, has a tool online called the Resilient Lands Mapping. So there are lots of resources out there for you to incorporate into your local thinking about these things. Oh yes, and here we are at the end. <laughs> So I guess I'm the lead contact person, and there's my email. And uh, my home address, which I shouldn't have put in there probably. <laughs> and the Be Wild Rewild website, which has lots and lots of cool stuff on it. Lots and lots. So please check it out. And with that, thank you very much. Aww.